live from Washington, D.C., it's theCUBE, covering Inforum DC 2018. Brought to you by Infor. Good afternoon and welcome back to the Walter Washington Convention Center. We're at Inforum 2018 here live on theCUBE. John Walls with Dave Vellante. And it's a pleasure now to welcome the CEO of Infor, Charles Phillips with us. Charles, good to see you. Good to see you guys again, another year. Thanks yeah, for it's on. Great. It's you great. are a man in demand, aren't you? Um, I mean, tell me about the, the week so far for you, how it's gone and just your overall thoughts about the show. Uh, it's been a, a fun in forum for 2018 here. Um, great attendance and a lot of energy level. And uh, the common feedback we get is that you guys just keep innovating and bringing new things. Uh, this is great and that's why they come. They want uh, to see what we're working on and kind of dream of the art of the possible. And we know what, you, what we think you did a couple years ago, but if we don't have someone pushing us, and painting a picture of what we could be doing and then we just think we might be missing it, so we want to hear it firsthand. So that's what the conference is about and hopefully they got that. Oh, certainly um, thematically, human potential, you talk about that. Um, you see that on the keynote stage, that's been a very consistent theme. With our guests here, uh, we've heard that a lot, you hear it down on the show floor. Talk about the theme, if you would, a little bit uh, in terms of its development, where that came from, and, and then how you think that's being expressed here this week. Well, we're one of the few companies that build mission critical operational systems, be it you know manufacturing or you know hospital operations. Uh, but we're also in HCM in a big way, and so we were talking to kind of both sides of the house. For some applications, you're talking to the line of business manager, but for HCM, you're talking to the CHRO. And rarely were those two people talking. And we saw obvious synergies. Don't, don't you want to know how your people are doing, how to allocate people, and how they're performing, and how they're changing the outcomes on a manufacturing floor in a hospital? And a lot of HR directors weren't thinking like that because they think of HR and they have their own world. They go to HR conferences and that's it. And the manufacturing guys do the same thing. And so we're trying to bring these two worlds together and say, actually, you're in the same business, same goals, and you actually could help each other a lot. And so by focusing on putting the employee at the center of all these applications and mapping all these operational processes to HR data, uh, it's a different way of thinking about the role of HR. They can actually help drive the business, not just be an administrative function. And so it's resonating with a lot of the uh, CHROs we've met with because they, they want to see at the table, they want to be more strategic, and this is a way for them to do that. At the same time, the operational people want to know how their people are doing, want to develop talent, and want to know what are the tools out there I could be doing differently, and you know, how am I doing, and which employees are working the best. So I think we can bring both sides together. So I first met Infor uh, through AWS at reInvent. <coughs> Pam Murphy came on and we were like, Infor? It was back then, it was I think 2012, yeah, 2013, yeah. it was kind of Infor who? <coughs> and then we were invited to New Orleans and then started to learn more about your micro vertical strategy and a little bit about the platform. It was somewhat opaque to me. And now fast forward last year and this year, it's really starting to come in to view. Um, yeah. The OS, the platform vision, the burst acquisition, and of course, you know, Coleman. And I'm a sucker for platform plays, especially when there's real R&D behind it that's actually having a business impact. So I wonder if you could talk about that piece of the strategy. I love the stack. And I mean, was that sort of always your vision? And it, now you're getting aggressive in it? Did it sort of come together serendipitously? How'd we get here? Uh, having our own stack and a platform was always the vision, but it's a lot harder to do than it sounds like, and it takes time. And so when we arrived uh, uh, almost eight years ago, there were different applications, all had their own separate stacks, and we said, this is not going to work. So we need to, just to be able to scale, to be able to serve multiple industries with different products, we can't have every development organization building their stack as well. So we set about taking that away from the development groups. We're going to do this as a shared service, but it takes time. And as we build it, you will adopt components of it. So what's changed is we built out the entire stack. So, you know, starting with Ion, with integration, then we added document management, workflow, analytics, now AI, and a lot of other services. Mongoose, uh, platform as a service, on and on and on, collaboration. Those things took time. They're all on a single platform, federated security, single sign-on across it all, and now, it makes the developer's job who's developing the app so much simpler. So they have, and for OS, for the immediate platform, for cloud services, they have AWS, I don't have to worry about any of those things anymore. Just go develop industry functionality. So it's come together nicely, but the fact that we had the time to do it, and the money to do it, 
and we weren't public and we told our investors this is the only way this is going to scale and this is the future and it'll pay off later you just got to trust us mm -hmm. and now that we've gotten there they're seeing the synergy and go okay now we see why why you did that so michael dell has been on the cube many times he used to talk about the 90-day shot clock we obviously saw, seen what he's <laughs> done in terms of transforming uh, but i want to talk about your business a little bit uh, because you've had that patient capital you, you you're i mean you're a quasi public company in the sense that you do report so yes. we can see the numbers in the income statement but the income statement doesn't really tell the whole story it's about three billion in revenue you got you know several hundred million dollars in the balance sheet and if you look at the SaaS component of it it looks rather small maybe i don't know 25 percent of the business but from a booking standpoint I'm sure it's much, much larger than that. So how should we interpret the income statement in terms of the momentum in your business? Where, where is all the action? Uh, so as a percentage of our sales, it's the highest of any of our competitors. So about 70% of our new sales are on SaaS. Uh, we have about a $700 million SaaS business. So it's growing, um, and if you, there's nothing we can do about the maintenance piece of it, which was related to perpetual. So if you take that out, it's a big percentage of our business. And over time, the maintenance will turn into SaaS. So that's one of our big opportunities to look at that maintenance space and say, move those over to cloud customers. And that's usually a uh, financially lucrative thing for us to do because we, we do even more for them because they usually add on four or five other products when they move. They replace these third party products and so we get a bigger suite of products when, if they decide to move to the cloud. So that's part of the strategy. That's what Upgrade X is. Let's move you from on premise so that maintenance revenue will turn into SaaS revenue, but bigger SaaS revenue over time. So let me make sure I understand. So it's not the, the classic case where you see a lot of software companies that are going from a perpetual model to a ratable model, you're going from a maintenance model, which is ratable, to a ratable model, which is SaaS, but there's cohort sales, which increase the top line, is that correct? Exactly, because usually, because of what we do, we're doing something mission critical, so if you're going to take that, then you, you should do HCM and financials, and PL, all the other things around it, so why would I move to core and leave the, the edge on premise? So, by almost by definition, we have to do the whole suite. So, when we do that, it expands the deal, because on the premise, we may have been one vendor with 30 other ones existing, but the whole reason they want to get out of all of that is to move to the cloud and simplify. So we can't take all that with us, so we we have to have the full suite. So we built that now. So now we can move them, but it expands the size of the deal because we're replacing all these other products. Okay, and then some of the stats, just correct me if I don't get this right, your SaaS business growing 50% faster than Oracle's, growing at a rate, uh, uh, let's say 2X SAPs in a rate comparable to Workday. Are those correct? Yes, those figures? are correct and profitable. Oh, and profitable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Throw that in. Yeah. <laughs> right. right, so, okay, and then, so you guys, last year, uh, Coke Industries invested, so you kind of recap the company, you've, you've, you've made a big deal about that. One of the things that we've noted is, you're seeing a tailwind there in terms of guys like Accenture and you know, Capgemini, and we've asked them, Do you, you guys service Coke Industries? They said, yep. They helped us see the opportunity and they said, look, you look for something substantive. We're not going to try to force you to do something, but we want you to take a look. So that's been helpful. Talk about that and maybe other things that Coke has brought to the table. Yeah, I would say uh, the relationship with the integrators is evolving. It probably was not a plus for us in the you know, first four or five years. Uh, more recent years, we've won enough deals where they had to say, okay, we, we can't keep losing these deals, and where they wanted to get engaged. Coke helped uh, because they had relationships and they wanted to run that business as well. They're implementing our products globally, and so they're a large customer for all of these guys, and so one of the largest for Deloitte, for instance. Uh, but it was really more that helped, but it was more the what was happening in the market, that the fact that we're, we're in a Liberty still and replaced SAP, or that we're you know, run a, a Travis Perkins and defeated SAP and Microsoft. So if you're on the wrong side of those deals enough time, your manager starts to ask you what's, what's going on and you got all these people on the bench here. Uh, okay, we train them for Infor if they're winning in that region and, or in that industry. So we just had to earn our way into it. Our, our initial strategy was not one that, at least on the surface, looked like it was integrator friendly because we were trying to take all those mods that they like to do and put them in the product. And that was the whole thesis that let's take the vertical industry features and let's put it in there once. I don't want everybody customizing my apps. We do that. And so now they've had to move up, okay, we can do other things, configuration, change management, there's AI, there's other things you can do, but you're not going to do that. So now that they've accepted that, there's a basis for us to work together, and it just had to, took time to get there. Well, what can you tell us about where you want to go with this? I mean, you've, you've presided over public companies before, you know that business well, you were you know, a rock star analyst. Um, is there a vantage to being a public company? Is that something that you eventually you know, want to do? Um, 
I would say there are pluses and minuses. Our, our board is evaluating that. That's going to be their call. Uh, the upside is it, it would solve probably our biggest challenge, which is brand recognition, almost instantly, because this would be a you know, top 10 tech IPO. Uh, it makes it a little easier to hire people because they can see public currency they can value uh, more quickly, and it gives you some acquisition currency. So those, those are the positives. Uh, but then you are on the 90-day cycle, but we're kind of on that anyway, because we report mm. publicly and uh, we have publicly traded bonds. And uh, so for us, it's, you know, in some sense, we have the worst of all worlds, right? We have the discipline of being a public company and the scrutiny without the capital <laughs> and the branding. Um, so I think that's what uh, everybody's uh, evaluating. Every bank on Wall Street's visiting us, telling us to go now, the window's great, you, well, guys, you have the numbers. <laughs> and so, you know, so we could do it. I just don't know what the decision's going to be. There are advantages to being private as well. You have a little more flexibility, obviously. And uh, we don't need the capital. We have plenty of capital coming from Coke and, and others who want to invest. Well, the flip side of that too is you get to write your own narrative, right? I mean, yeah. you know, we're talking about the nuances of the income statement. The street is obviously right now hooked on the growth heroin. And if you yeah. have a transition in the base, you, you can't, it's not, it doesn't become a tailwind. So no rush from, from that standpoint. I want to pivot to the theme of this event, yeah. which is the human potential. Um, my understanding is you sort of were instrumental in coming up with that. Yeah. Um, HCM this year got a, a, a big play on stage. Yeah. Where's that come from? Yeah, I just as I talk to CEOs who are struggling to find talent, like I mentioned on stage, 6.7 million jobs that are unfulfilled. It's not like we don't have people here. Uh, we have people here with the wrong skills. So you're not going to fill those jobs any other way. We're not doing immigration to any degree and scale anymore. We, that's been shut down. We have an aging population with the baby boomers. So the most logical thing you would do is train people who are already here who want to work. <laughs> and let's take people who have jobs that they probably aren't thrilled about and give them different skills so they can fill these 6.7 million jobs. So to do that, you have to make these applications easier to use. And I felt like we're probably in the best position to do it because we actually know what they do for a living because we wrote all those last mile features in those industries. We understand what they do. And if you're just done HR application or financials, you actually have no idea what they do. <laughs> so we had to learn those jobs to automate those jobs. And so we can uh, find ways to use our ACM applications to better train people, professional development, coaching, take all these HR skills and put them as part of the applications in the context of why you're working. You know, we, we had Ann Benedict on just a little bit ago and talking about uh, really a test case you know, that, that you can be for yourself. Yeah. And so how are you putting these things to practice yourself and how are you working out maybe some kinks uh, before you take them out to somebody else? And so you can leverage your own success for your own success um, and also learn from mistakes too, I would think. We do, so we have this program called N4 at N4, where everything we do, we want it to be on an N4 product, uh, which was not the case when we arrived at, you know, like every, a lot of companies, uh, a, a mishmash of different things. And so we've implemented our own HR financials, of course, burst, uh, but the big innovation has really been talent science, that every employee we hire has to take that test, and, and all the executives have taken it as well. And uh, what we've discovered is, is that uh, when people hire and go against the talent science recommendation, 68% of the time they end up being wrong. So it's better at judging people than people are sometimes. And you can't use it exclusively, but it'll tell you these are the things you should look into, some questions you might want to ask. Here's how they rate on certain skill sets. They're very well matched for this job. They look like these are your best performance in this area, but ask these questions. And so. People don't know how to interview and how to, you know, how to think about this. And so having a guide to go into an interview is actually very helpful. We hire much better people now by using that. So it's like StrengthsFinder in a way? I mean, the, no, it's it, different uh, from that. This is, this is uh, AI, it's kind of money ball for business people. So you're yeah. talking, well, you're talking about that today. Almost. Yeah, so it's 39 personality attributes, uh, behavioral attributes we call them. So empathy, resistance to authority, uh, do you have ambition or not? And depending on the job, you think all those things are good. It depends on the job. So, you know, for, a, for some jobs, it's actually better to have low ambition because the, the, a lot of our uh, customers who have low-wage fast food service jobs, people who have ambition are going to leave in four months, right? They're not going to stay. So, they, okay, we, we know you're not going to be here long. At least know that going in. And know who wants to get promoted. And other people are fine with it. And so it depends on the mix of skills. It's like I say, 39 attributes. And for that job role, you tune it to the people who like that job. They, they look like this. And we've also found that it's 60% more diverse when you hire using science because you don't, you don't know that when you're looking at the data, right? What they look like. 
Must have been super interesting getting those reports. Oh, it's, you it's took fascinating. It, yeah, I right? took it. How'd it, you do? Uh, <laughs> nobody ever likes their. I was going to say. I bet you I would be really defensive <laughs> about this. Yeah, yeah, oh, I don't no, know. No, no, right. This can't be right. <laughs> <laughs> so it, I am not like that. Every person on the executive team said the same thing. So, was, but, but it was, you know, it, that's what it's for. Is to you have certain perceptions even about yourself, and it calls it out. Right. And there's no gaming the system because the questions have no right or wrong answers. It just puts you in scenarios that you answer. What would you do? How do you feel about this? And you're not clear what they're trying to get at, and you only have 20, 27 minutes or 22 minutes to do the test. You can't game it. You can't game it. Uh, and the data doesn't lie. Hey. And we built the science. We know when someone's trying to game it. If they're tr taking too long or multiple change their answers too much. So it's, and we now I think we've tested some 200 million people uh, over time, over years. So we have 20 years of data uh, about people. That's, I, I mean, Sounds unique, I've, certainly unique in terms of being infused into uh, enterprise software. Yeah. I've not seen anything like this from another s enterprise software company. I mean, yeah. Can you confirm that? Or? Yeah, so we're the only ones that do this at scale. There's a few startups trying to do it, but they're trying to do it all facial recognition, which is, we think, pretty ridiculous. It, that's, we're trying to get away from physical attributes, not use that. So there's, there's a company out there doing that, say, depending on your facial movements. Uh, but this is, we're eliciting responses about your personality in, re, in, in response to situations that we give you. And uh, have a bunch of scientists that crunch the data and they basically shape it to the job role. And they test your best performance and you get a DNA profile for your best performance for that job role. And then uh, you, that's what you're matching. And it's highly accurate, so we had a, a uh, company on the Las Vegas Strip use it because they have to hire in volume a lot. And essentially what they wanted to do was get better blackjack dealers. And somebody's good at math, good, on, you know, good under pressure, uh, not too emotive, and don't give away anything. And so we did that, fine tune the test. They called us back nine months later and said, we need you to change the test. We said, we did exactly what you wanted. What happened? He said, well, you know, the winnings went up 30%, but everybody's leaving the hotel in 24 hours because they lost all their money. Yeah. So we don't need them to be that good. Tile it down a little Yeah, bit. yeah, yeah, <laughs> which we did. So yeah. we, that's part of the service is we t fine tune it. You know, you tell us what your goals are, we will tune to that. That's a great story. I'll pay. The other, the other surprise for me this week has been the emphasis on robotic process automation. Yeah. It's a space that we've kind of looked at and, and I love, and a lot of people are scared about software robots replacing humans. When you talk to people who are using RPA, they love it. Yeah. It's taking away these mundane tasks. I didn't realize that you guys had such capabilities there. Yeah. Yeah, so we built that as part of a Coleman RPA platform, and not only can we automate and use RPA for ourselves, but we built a whole development environment for our customers to build their own, because we can't think of every process uh, that they might want to automate, and we gave that platform to our partners as well. So while they, we don't want them doing database schema work anymore, and that you, they used to get paid for that, there's other things you can do up the stack in AI. Here's what we want you to focus on. So we, we had that meeting on Monday with the partners, and they all agreed that's what we're going to do. But there's tons of mundane things that people shouldn't be spending time on, and you can, they can be much more productive, it makes them more loyal to the company, they're enjoying their job more, and they're thinking and innovating more. So I don't see it as replacing people, it's making people better. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, it's, and giving that engagement that I talked about during the keynote, they're engaged now because they can do more things that are more value added, you know. So back to New Orleans next year, that's where we first, the first inform that theCUBE was ever at was in, yeah. was in New Orleans, and uh, uh, jazz, you, you like jazz, obviously, well, right? I, yes. I like jazz. I met with the mayor when I was down there, Mitch Landrieu at the time, and he became a customer after that meeting. So oh. the city of New Orleans uh, runs on uh, Infor Software. It's another reason to go there, so thank you. get nice. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Mitch. And so that worked well. And so as a thank you, we're going back down there. They're a big customer now, and it's always fun in New Orleans, I mean, you know. It's great. All right. Just, and before you go, uh, you mentioned, uh, watching the keynote this morning, um, Brooks Kepka. Yes. So you're working with him. I do a little bit of work on the, on the golf side as well. So I was just intrigued because um, he's not the, uh, well, he's not Tiger, right? Yeah. The US Open champion twice over. What was the attraction to him? And, and can you play in the golf world a little bit and, and, and with those brands and, and have, is that an entry in, into that world? Uh, well, we always like to bet on the scrappy guy, the next up and coming, the next generation guy, and, and that's kind of our, our brand. That's what we are. That's what we're, the Brooklyn Nets, the, someone who's not quite there yet, but they're moving up. That's kind of our scrappiness. That's why we like the bro whole Brooklyn image as well. And we started talking to him, like I said, before we won the U.S. Open because he was ranking pretty high, moving up. It wasn't well known, uh, but a quiet guy, 
uh, very personable when you meet him. We thought he'd be good in front of clients. Let's bet on his career, and we're going to work with him. Oh. And then uh, literally three weeks later, he wins the U.S. Open. We go, okay. <laughs> we'll <laughs> <Good> take it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we didn't think it was going to happen that quickly, and now he's a rock star. So we were planning on hosting a CX event with him, and uh, we're, you know, we're not sure how many people are going to come, but when that happened now, all the, everybody RSVP'd right away, of course. So now it's, it's doing exactly what we wanted. Do you play golf? Uh, I don't play golf. I just started playing because we were doing these golf tournaments with customers over the last year, but I haven't had enough time to get out there yet. I'll bet Brooks will give you a lesson or two. Yeah, he, he, uh, <laughs> a lot right. of people want a lesson from him. Charles, thank you. All right, thank time. you guys. Good to see you again. Great show. Uh, see you in New Orleans. Thank you. Yeah. Congratulations. All right, guys. Wonderful see ya. week here in Washington, D.C. Back with more live on theCUBE here from D.C. right after this.